Tonight, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13, specifically as we think of some of the obstacles that we face to our faith. We first begin by talking about the threat of temptation. You see, all of us make choices in life. Sometimes we make good choices. Sometimes, unfortunately, we make poor choices, right? There's always the tendency in the lives of some that will then yield to that temptation. Now, Paul had said there in verses 11 through 13 that God is faithful who will not suffer us to be tempted above that which we are able, right? But will with the temptation also make a way of escape. And so now go back, if you will, drop down to verse 6 and notice what is said here in the first part of verse 6. Paul said again, referencing the Israelite people, and these things were our examples, As you well know, God delivered ancient Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Now, he promised to Abraham in Genesis 15 that his descendants would sojourn in a land, in a strange land, for some 400 years. And afterward, he said, they will come out. Now, God fulfilled that promise, didn't he? He delivered the children of Israel out of bondage, out of slavery. And God said to Moses in Exodus 19 and verse 4, He says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and I bore you on eagles' eagles wings and brought you to myself. You see, God had brought the children of Israel out of bondage. He sustained them. He cared for them. He blessed them greatly. And yet time and time again in the history of Israel, they seemed to always want to turn their backs on God. They succumb to temptation. And what Paul is saying here is that as children of God today, we face a multitude of trials, a multitude of temptations within our life. Sometimes individuals have the mentality, if you will, that they will never succumb to a certain temptation. And so Paul said, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, So let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. He furthermore points out that temptation is common to all people. Temptation is no respecter of persons. And so the question is, will we rise above temptation or will we succumb to it? A second question might be, will we learn from the past? That's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes we don't seem to want to learn from the past. You know, in our studies that we've had on the major and the minor prophets, uh, that those who fail to learn from history are destined to repeat it, right? There's another saying that I've come to appreciate, and that is, if there is anything that we have learned from history, is that we have not learned from history, right? Right? When you think about that and you allow that to resonate in your mind, you'll see that it's very true. There are many things that have occurred in the days gone by. We can look back and we see clearly the pitfalls of our predecessors. And yet we will turn around and we'll do the same things, the very same things as they did. And so what Paul is saying here is that as children of God... We need to be on guard. And the reason is, is because the devil is doing everything within his power to destroy our faith. To destroy our faith. You know, to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, Paul said, Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that ye may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of of the devil. The devil has a lot of tactics, a lot of schemes that he employs to lead us away from Almighty God. I would grant you that the devil is operating in the world in which we live in even today. I would say that the devil is behind this virus. 
I would say the devil is behind a lot of things that are happening in our world today. And he uses those in human instruments to carry out his will. We have to understand that the devil is not only lurking in the world and operating in the hearts and lives of, of those who were in the world, but that his intent is to destroy us who belong to the body of Christ. You look at the church of Corinth, and even though those people had obeyed the gospel, been baptized into Christ, sanctified in Christ, identified as his saints, they had a lot of problems, didn't they? And so Paul sought to encourage them. You know, James said in the long ago, he said, resist the devil and he will flee from you, right? James 4, 7. The question is not, can we resist and overcome temptation? The question is, will we? Will we do it? And as I think about life and the choices that we make in this life, the choices that are before us, right and wrong, good and evil, truth and error, every one of us, all of us, must decide where we will stand. What would you do? What road will we take? You remember Jesus in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, close to the end of his Sermon on the Mount, he presented to us the two roads of life. He talked about the straight and the narrow is the road that he wants us to follow that ultimately leads to life eternal. But that the broad road, the wide gate that he said that leads to destruction, there's going to be so many that will follow that because it's so easy to travel down such a road as that. And Jesus said to those who were assembled on that day, and many there be which go in their eye, there are a a lot of folks that are happy to walk that broad way that leads to destruction. Sadly, sometimes even Christians. Members of the body of Christ make very poor choices. I understand how those of us that belong to the body of Christ can succumb in times of weakness to temptation. I understand that sometimes that we can get so caught up, if you will, in a situation or circumstance that we might yield and thus engage in sin. We're not, uh, again, we're not a, uh, totally uh, able to be away from that. It's going to come. But we also need to understand this as well, that God wants us to rise above that temptation, to rise up above those sins. James said, let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when that lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. And so James said in James 1 and verse 16, Do not err, my beloved brethren. So, again, as we travel the road of life, and sometimes as we yield to temptation, and that temptation leads us to sin, what we have to do is to be able to step back and then recognize our faults, repent of them because we realize those faults and ask God to forgive us so that we can then move forward without hesitation. That's what he wants us to do. That's what God is asking us to do. That's the biblical way. John said in 1 John 1, 6 through 7, he said, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In chapter 2 and verse 1, John would then continue to say, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Now that's the divine idea 
that we as God's people rise above sin. But he said, if any man sins, let him know that he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so, yes, sometimes we do succumb. Sometimes we give in and we engage in what the Bible identifies really as the transgression of the law of God. But the remedy, again, is to turn to God. Because you see, in 1 John 1 and verse 9, John said, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the choices are before us. Now Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1, he says, Paul here goes all the way back to the Israelite nation and the fact that God had delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. He says, moreover, brethren, I would not that you be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But now look at verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. In order for us to appreciate what Paul is saying here, we would have to go all the way back to Numbers 13 and 14 for just a moment to realize the account here that has been given to us with the sending out of the 12 spies to survey the promised land, a land that God had said had flowed with milk and honey, right? It was a bountiful land, and God had promised to give them this land. Not only only did did God promise to give them the land, He also fulfilled that promise. But nonetheless... If you look at Numbers 13 and verse 1, the text tells us here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel, Verses 1 through 3. Now, we see here that 12 spies, there were 12 tribes, one from each tribe, 12 spies were dispatched to survey the land. Verse 21. And then they returned after 40 days. Verse 25. The text tells us in verse 26 of Numbers 13 that they departed and came back to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sinnest, and surely it flowed with milk and honey. And guess what? Here's the fruit of it. There's the fruit of it. Look at verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, when the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. 28 through 30. Now, thank God for men like Joshua, right? Who believed that God would fulfill his promise, that he had the ability, if you will, the power to bring them into the promised land. But I want you now to notice verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. 
And they brought up an evil report of the land which thou hast searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that saw it, that we saw in it, are men of a great stature. And there, were, there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come unto giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. As a result of what these ten spies, the children of Israel, failed to believe God. What is that because of the majority? Two come back with a good report, ten come back with a bad report, and we automatically are going to believe the ten? They trusted the words of those ten over the report given initially to, by Caleb. And so in Numbers 14 and verse 1, I want you to listen, if you will, to what is said. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we have died in the land of Egypt, or would God we have died in this wilderness? Notice what they now say. Look at verse 3 of Numbers 14. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? Can you even imagine that? Can you believe that the very people that had cried out that they were under the oppression of Pharaoh and they felt like they were better in that situation than they were out there away from the Egyptian bondage? As a matter of fact, Moses writes in Exodus 1 and verse 8, he says, now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Joseph had been a life for God in a pagan land. And it was under the oversight of Joseph and the providential care of God that Israel was allowed to settle in the land of Goshen. And there they became a mighty nation of people. Some two million or so people came out of a bunch that they now want to return. Look at verse 4. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. I just imagine Moses thinking, these people have totally lost their mind. They had totally lost their mind. Look at verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. They were horrified at what was going on. And so again, they tried to encourage, they tried to inspire these people. Look at verse 7. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. You see, God was with them. They had everything they could ever want as long as God was with them. When they crossed the Red Sea, he would be with them. As they entered the promised land, if only they believed that God would fulfill his word, God was with them. And so Moses records these words in verse 10. He says, But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have shown among them? When you go back and you look at Exodus 7 through 12, 
You think about the children of Israel and the Egyptian bondage. Of course, those chapters gives us those ten plagues that we know so much about. And God performed ten miracles before Pharaoh and the people. And every miracle was directed at one of the pagan deities of, of Egypt, culminating with the very death of the firstborn. And thus the children of Israel had seen all of these things. And so in verse 12 here, here's what God said. He says, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. There are a lot of people in the world today that have that idea that once saved, always saved. Let me tell you right now. It wasn't true under those who lived in the Mosaic dispensation as much as it's not true even today. God said, I will disinherit them. Let's go back and let's look at our text here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want you to notice what Paul writes in verse 5. Lick your fingers and turn your pages, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. There were a lot of folks that did not make it to the promised land. When the apostle Paul is saying to those of us who live today that he was saying this to those who belong to the church at Corinth and the people of every age, if we do not rise above temptation and strive to the best of our ability to live a faithful, godly life in Christ Jesus, we will not make it to the promised land. That's right. The bottom line is that we will not go to heaven. Just because somebody's been baptized into Christ does not mean that there's a one-way ticket to heaven. I understand the importance of being baptized into Christ. We have to be baptized into Jesus Christ so that our sins might be washed away, Acts twenty-two sixteen. But there's a lot more involved than just being baptized. We willingly repent of every sin, as Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, Acts 17, 30. We confess with our mouth that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then we are immersed in water so that all of our sins might be washed away. The people in Corinth understood this. Many of those people had done that. Some of those people had come out of idolatry. Some have come out of immorality. Some have come out of what we would say heathen backgrounds, pagan backgrounds, to become children of God. And so what Paul is saying is this. You've got to dig in. And you've got to fight the good fight of faith. As we live the Christian life, we have to understand that the devil is doing everything within this power to destroy our faith. And thus, he puts those obstacles in front of our faith. And Paul's going to isolate some problems associated with the children of Israel here, problems that destroyed them. What he's saying is this. If we are not careful, these very same problems can become a thorn in our side we, to cause us to lose our eternal soul. I don't know of anybody that doesn't want to go to heaven. We all want to go to heaven. But Jesus said to be faithful even unto death. That is, even in the face of death for the cause of Christ, that promise then be in the crown of life. And so, unless we are willing to walk that straight and narrow road and rise above those temptations, understanding that sometimes, yes, we do succumb. We need to have in our minds that we're not going to back, we're not going to go back to that life of habitual sin. We are not going back into that sinning business. The first problem that Paul identifies is the problem of idolatry. 
Listen, if you will, to what is said beginning in verse 6. He says, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. In the Old Testament, God was very clear when it came to idolatry. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and Moses received those commandments on the mountaintop, written as recorded in Exodus chapter 20 by the very finger of God, by the hand of God. And the very first commandment is in verse 3 of Exodus 20, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. What did he say? Thou shalt not have other gods before before me. Not only were there not to have other gods before him, but God said in verse 4, Thou shalt not make into, unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Now, we go to Exodus 32, if you will. Exodus 32. And here we have the record of the golden calf. And the text tells us that the children of Israel began to question what had happened to Moses. Look at verse 1, Exodus 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together under Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. I would guess that that was a lot of gold. Verse 3, And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and, break, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and he fashioned it with as a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Paul here is reminding the people in Corinth of this very moment. Lest we think that idolatry is a problem confined to those people that live in the distant ages, we better think again. Did you know that John in 1 John 5, 21 said, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What is an idol? You know, typically we think about that which has been graven by the hands of men, whether it takes the form of wood, metal, steel, or whatever. Idolatry takes many forms, and it takes many shapes. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 5, Paul would say that covetousness is idolatry. That is, that inordinate desire for that which is forbidden. Now, just think for a moment about the golden calf problem that we have even today. You know, when I was a young fellow growing up in Orlando, I don't recall hearing much about other religions. I, by that, I mean religions other than Judaism and Christianity but a lot has changed through the years. We are living in a day and an age where there are a lot of folks that are engaged in pagan idolatry. Paul dealt with the problem of idolatry. He dealt with it in uh, Lystron, where they tried him in Barnabas. He dealt with it in the city of Athens. And the Bible says in, in uh, 1716, of which he says, the whole city was given unto idolatry. Acts 17, 16. Paul's spirit was stirred within him when he saw that. 
And so Paul sought to correct those who would put their faith and trust in a pagan idol. If you were to ask Alexa or Google, which is the second largest, what is the second largest religion in the U.S., and do you know what they would tell you? That it's Islam. Now that's sad. That's sad. I've been told that Islam is the fastest growing religion today. Is why they have gotten up to the second status. And they could surpass over Christianity as being number one. It is certain that we are living in a day and a time where there are a lot of folks that are buying into this far eastern religions. Buddha and etc. Many are become followers of Muhammad. But what we have to understand is that there is only one God and only one Father, as Paul had said. But the problem of idolatry is not merely confined to religions like Buddha or Muhammad or whatever. We are confronted with idolatry in the form of materialism, money, power, and fame. What did Jesus say in the long ago? For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 10, he says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we'll take nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they have, will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many have been led astray from the faith. You see, you don't have to bow down to Buddha to be an idolater. If you have a love for money more than any other thing, then you've got a problem with greed or covetousness, of which Paul said is idolatry. There are a lot of people in our world today that simply do not understand that anything that comes between them and Jehovah God is idolatry. Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, Anything that comes between us and our relationship with God will destroy our faith, and it will become an idol to us. We've got to be faithful in our walk with God. And even more so during his, this pandemic that we're dealing with in our world today. Satan has done everything possible in keeping us apart. And to keep us from walking that straight and that narrow road. Come what may. But what I want us to understand is this. Is that we're in a battle. We're in a war. And the battle is for our souls. It's a war against our souls. What's most important is not your car, not your house, not your job. What is most important is your soul. Jesus said, if you lose your soul, you've lost everything. Everything. I want to go to heaven. And I know that you do too. And so if you're watching tonight and you're not a Christian, I want you to think about your soul. You know, in our world, we always plan to do things. We make plans to go on vacation. We make plans for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's Columbus Day. People are making plans to uh, get together as family or something, or if they have that day off. People are making plans. They're, they might have made those plans way ahead of time. But why is it that when it comes to our soul, we don't make those plans to know which way and where 
our soul is going to go when this life is over. Hebrews 9.27 said, It's appointed unto man once to die, then cometh the judgment. We're all going to be there. We're going to be going to be there on judgment day. And we need to realize that we're going to be judged accordingly. To those things that we have done, whether it's good or bad, we will be judged accordingly. We will all be there, but it will be personal to us because as individuals, he will be judging us directly. We need to realize our soul is in jeopardy if we don't make the plans to be right come that day when we die. We don't know when we're going to die. James talked about our life as being a vapor that appeared for a short time and then vanishes away. Here today, gone tomorrow. We need to be ready. Make plans for your soul even tonight. Don't let another day go by without contacting us and let us know that you based upon your faith and believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, based upon your wanting to make the necessary changes in your life, to repent of those sins, to make that good confession of the name of Jesus, that He is the Son of the living God, and be baptized in that watery grave for the remission of every sin. When you come up out of the waters of baptism, you'll feel so much better. You will know that if you were to die right now, heaven would be your home Please realize that Jesus pray, paid the price for your sins. He came, lived, and died, and shed his blood on Calvary's cross so that you might have everlasting life. If you believe that and willing to make the necessary changes, we hope that you will. You can do what they did on Pentecost Day, where Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Then you will become a child of God 